What do you think that film is about? In a nutshell, there's there's two narratives. One, which is what was used to get the investors in. Um, Kubrick had, you have to look at the context of it. Um, Kubrick had just done Dr. Strangelove mm. four or five years before uh, um, 2001 came out. Dr. Strangelove upset a lot of people. It was so anti, it was probably the most anti-establishment movie, the most effectively anti-establishment movie I've ever seen. Mm. And that, I include all of Kubrick's other films on that level. Really? Uh, yeah, because he just went for the throats of the people who he viewed as being a problem mm. at the top of society. He went after the Pentagon top people. Yeah. He had characters in Dr. Strangelove who basically blatantly represented specific people who did actually operate through the Pentagon and these think tank groups. He even mocked Operation Paperclip within it, didn't he, with the, oh, the, yeah. the Germans? And Big stuff. term, yeah. yeah. He was yeah. onto that. Uh, he mocked uh, the Rand Corporation. They got mm. called the Bland Corporation in the film. <laughs> and he, he'd he read all of their stuff that was publicly available at these think tank groups and stuff. It's You know, a lot of people think of this stuff as being really secretive. Mm. And I always thought, how the hell did Kubrick know this stuff? Mm. But when I uh, started studying Dr. Strangelove, um, I, I realised that, hang on, all the information he needed was actually out there publicly. Mm. It just took him to gather it all together and cross-reference it. Mm. Uh, and he worked more openly with the other writers on that film. He wasn't hiding his agendas like he did with 2001. Mm. So anyway, uh, Dr. Strangelove came out. Kubrick got attacked in the press as being a commie. And his career, I think, probably would have been finished after Dr. Strangelove because he'd upset too many people, mm. uh, powerful people. So what do you do next in that position as a filmmaker? How do you get the funds in and how do you make sure that you don't get attacked again? Right. Well, you go and make a movie which on surface appearances gives the establishment what it wants. Mm. Uh, he knew that the moon landing stuff was coming up. Uh, that, you know, that had been talked about by Kennedy. Oh, yes, we're going to put a man on the moon. Mm. And Kubrick's like, okay, so they want a pro-space race propaganda movie mm. that's going to sell the moon landings and it's going to sell space research and, um, and it's going to sell technology. So he started developing it from there and he was approaching different famous sci-fi writers. Mm. Um, and he ended up with Arthur C. Clarke. Mm -hmm. And as far as I can tell, what he was basically doing there was he needed somebody to be a front a convincing front who could go to industry and sell them this mm. bullshit movie, mm. this ultimate pro space race evolution of man to becoming God and, you know, tra transhumanist yeah. in a while away is yeah. 2001. He needed to sell that bullshit story. And rather than do it himself, I don't think he would have had the heart to go and stand up in these rooms with these corporate bosses and say all this stuff, gets Arthur C. Clarke to go and do it. Mm. And then, um, Clark actually believed in all those messages anyway, so that made it convincing. And, like, and then all these corporate bosses and um, people at NASA and places like that, they all loved Arthur C. Clarke anyway because he was very much into the idea of man turning into machine uh, and traveling to the stars and contacting alien races. And when we, when we contact these alien races, they're going to be nice to us. Yeah. They're going to they're gonna come to us and help us become gods, mm. which is bullshit because mm. if you look at human history, whenever one... Uh, civilization goes to another yeah. they steal all the resources and enslave them yeah well, why would it be any difference if an alien race superior came to earth you know? yeah. but you know this was all the stuff that clark was into and it matched up with the establishment um opinions on that stuff i'm not giving you a very short answer here am i no but um, this is this is this is this is good okay this yeah. is good okay so so he gets clark he develops the story with clark and he has clark sandboxed within that narrative Meanwhile, as far as I can tell, Kubrick's like, hmm, how can I make it appear that I'm making this particular narrative that Clark believes in and which all the investors are going to believe in? How can I make the film look like it's going to be that when it's released? Mm. And I will covertly turn the film slowly into what I want it to be, mm -hmm. which is basically the opposite message. Right. Um, and so the film has two conflicting narratives and... What, it's very complex how Kubrick did this. It's amazing the skill and the chess moves of how he did it. Mm. Keep Clark sandboxed. Keep the investors 
thinking within that sandbox, keep Clark talking to them. Meanwhile, develop a visual code mm. for the film that communicates the story that he really wants to tell. So you, right? okay, so you were a, you're a psychologist, but what stopped you from studying psychology is the arts. And what I see here is he's using psychology to fulfill his intention, but he's uh, to to ex not exploit people, but keep people where he wants them. But then he's actually going to fulfill his intention through art. Yeah. So the art is how yeah. it's the real subversive side. The psychology will just sandbox these people, get the investors on board, but then the art, because you can hide behind it. You go, well, that's your interpretation. Maybe that's what it means. Yeah. Maybe that's what it doesn't well, mean. And, and Kubrick, of course, having made lots of movies, and he was always studying psychology and science mm. and everything else. He was always reading tons of material, filling his head. Mm. He must, the guy must have been a walking library, you know. Mm. Um, but he... Um, so having uh, that that situation with the sandbox, he's sort of with it, with his knowledge of how metaphors worked in films, mm. um, he he sort of had taken a lot of the stuff that ex already existed in movies about how to convey things non-verbally. It's not like he was the first one to do visual storytelling, mm. I and mean, that was already done in the silent era anyway. Mm. But he took all of that stuff and he turned that into a much more precise science. And he did something which I think is a first in film history. He made a movie which actually carries two narratives at once. Okay. One is what the investors wanted. That got all the money in to make the movie. And the second is the, the visually conveyed narrative, which is the art side that he wanted to tell, which he couldn't let them know about. He couldn't let um, the crew, um, Arthur C. Clarke, he couldn't let them know about because if word got back... Mm investors would all pull out so on the one hand you've got a story of the space race because we hadn't done the moon landings yet it's going to be good it's optimistic it's positive there's going to be a positive end result and what was what's his real narrative then what's his real story as far as i can tell the real narrative is that <laughs> i'll try I, I think there's a lot of things communicated but i'll, I'll tell some of the basics uh, one is that this whole notion of uh, interstellar space travel is almost a ridiculous fantasy mm -hmm. the distances to travel mm. and the, the hostility of empty space mm. to the human condition is unbelievable it's like it's scary mm. and so at the start of the movie you get the boat the bone is thrown up becomes a spaceship and then you get all this fancy music oh isn't mm. it wonderful mm. all these spaceships flying around and then you go to the moon and you got a huge moon base in the year 2001 which we haven't even got a tiny moon base now. Right. And um, so, so the, the, that part of the movie shows the fantasy mm. of space research. Oh, isn't it wonderful? We're all going to the stars. and yeah. oh, Aliens are helping us get there and all this yeah. kind of stuff. Later on in the film, after um, Bowman has defeated Hal, mm. uh, which is like a defeating transhumanism, basically, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um then you get like the the whole crazy end sequence with Jupiter and stuff, and suddenly the music becomes terrifyingly scary. Yeah, at the, towards the end of the movie, yeah. and you see Jupiter and all of its moons, and I mean Jupiter's a, Jupiter's a fucking colossal beast, isn't it? Mm. I think it's a tenth of the size of the sun or something like that. Mm. And um, I think with all that scary stuff, he was showing, look, space isn't this wonderful, pretty music type. It's terrifying. Mm. Um, and I think his is still one of the very, very few movies, and it was probably the first one ever, that actually had spaces being completely silent. Yeah. You know? Um, and so he was trying to show people that, look, this is a bullshit fantasy. The, the void, the void of space is terrifying. It's not mm. built for us. Mm. And the chances of us travelling through it, I mean, 18 months just to get to Jupiter, mm. you haven't even come near the edge of the solar system. You know? Yeah. So... All that came across, and then all the stuff about uh, defeating Hal intellectually mm. in battle, um, I, I view that as being basically, uh, instead of celebrating artificial intelligence, which because IBM invested in the film, oh, okay. they thought they were getting a pro-AI movie, and Clark mm. had sold it to them on that basis. Mm. And then the movie that they got had Hal going crazy, killing people, mm. being very manipulative, mm. and then organic humans or one of them, defeating Hal and seizing back control of his life yeah. from the machine. Right. 
that's not the message that they wanted. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it, in the Kubrick archives, you know, I found there's, there's letters there at IBM were pissed when they saw the movie. Right. They were like, take our logos off the movie because they were all over the place in the movie. Oh, shit. Get the movie, you know, they, they were annoyed. Mm. But, and actually a lot of the investors were very annoyed. Um, and what one of the things Kubrick did that was incredibly sneaky, one of his many chess tactics in making the film is uh, when when the first sort of executive cut of the film was shown, not the cinema release, it was framed so that it would look more like what they wanted. Mm. It had a voiceover narration occasionally in the film that gave some waffle that fitted in the communicated Arthur C. Clarke's narrative. Right. Uh, and at the beginning of the film, there was 10 minutes worth of interviews with real scientists mm. about how plausible interstellar uh, space travel is mm. um, and about how artificial intelligence is the future of humanity and all that, all the messages that the executives and stuff wanted to hear. Mm -hmm. Then when he releases the movie, and he must have had Final Cut to do this, he must have convinced them so much that they gave him Final Cut. They must have thought, wow, we've got the brilliant Stanley Kubrick on our side. Yeah, we'll give him Final Cut. But they, they had no idea he was going to use a visual encoding thing. Yeah. And so when the movie got released, the narration was removed and the 10 minutes worth of interviews with scientists were removed and yeah. it's like it's a, suddenly the movie ceased to be that narrative and it mm. became a visually encoded experience mm. and kubrick was doing interviews and he's saying uh, there, there was one I'll, I'll paraphrase it he said something along the lines of people watch this movie uh well people don't watch this movie they listen to it they expect to be told mm. uh they 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 listen to this movie expecting things to be explained they shouldn't be listening you don't get much from this movie from that. You have to look mm. at what's going on in the movie. He was talking about visual encoding. And I know like I've, I've, I've talked about some elements of this in the, the videos I've done. And some people are like, oh, come on. Mm. How can one man be that clever? Mm. Well, people can be. They, they can be that clever. Yeah. Um, and it's kind of... Um, it's... it's how, how can I put it? You can almost take it as almost like an insult to yourself. You think, well, I'm really stupid because I don't know how to do all this stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you yeah. Know? It's a narcissistic injury. Oh. Yeah, 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 yeah. It is. It's an, it's an ego blow to think yeah. that somebody else could be that smart and you've probably been a fan of their film and seen it 20 times and you had no fucking clue yeah. that there was this other side to it because he never, ever told you. That's. I think that is a massive ego blow. Some people when they go back to a favorite movie and they learn that there's something else there or somebody else shows them it, mm. some people are like, wow, I love it. Now yeah. my favorite movie is even better. Yeah. And some people just take that ego blow and like, no, no, no. The way I perceived it is the way it is. And right. no, I didn't get fooled. You know? I, I hate that. I hate <laughs> when, pe when people start saying, no, the, uh, it's kind of like a postmodern stance. No, everything is open to perception and the way that I perceived it is the way. And it's like, well, there is an author, there is a director. They also have an intention. Like, I mean, you're free to do whatever you want in your own mind, but mm -hmm. don't tell me what the author's intention was. I, I read something. I don't know if you saw this. The opening shot of the movie where the bone is thrown up, that satellite um, was supposed to look like it was armed with nuclear weapons, but it doesn't. And he said, he said in an interview it was one of the mistakes of the movie. Um, because it was supposed to be a little bit more. It was another anti-nuclear war movie, but I only I, I only saw a satellite. I didn't get the impression of a military thing there, which was which was interesting. They got various national flags on the different satellites. Ah, yeah. okay, okay. So maybe that was a bit so more like of a space race. So there is an element to that. I think he said in one one interview that. He did talk about that was a, mm. an intention, but he said, well, I'd just done Dr. Strange Love. I didn't want to make that... A, oh, is that what it was? Repeat that same message. Oh, okay. Um, but okay. if I remember rightly, in the novel, uh, the novelization, and this is another interesting little aspect mm. of it, is um, the original short story by Arthur C. Clarke was mm. nothing like the movie at all. Mm. It didn't even have Hal or anything like that. And so when they were making the movie, Kubrick had Clarke write a novelization to go with the movie, and it's very different to the movie. Mm. Um but Clark, um, Kubrick had authorization rights. He was able to tell Clark, you will remove this from the book. You mm. will put this in the book. Oh. Yeah. So okay. Clark Clark was his bitch, basically. Oh, wow. You know, um, he really had him under the thumb. Yeah. It, it, I've always felt, felt like that was a bit of a disservice to Clark. I felt like he, he was kind of manipulated there. Yeah. Um, 
Oh, what was I going to say? Oh, yeah, the um, the nuclear thing. If I remember rightly, in the novel, um, the star child at the end comes back to Earth, mm. sees all these nuclear satellites floating in the, the atmosphere, well, mm. not in the atmosphere, but above the Earth, and, and recognises the threat to humanity that they represent and sets them all off. Okay. Clears the, the Earth's sky of all these nuclear weapons. Okay. And it's like, okay, now we can move forward. In the movie, at, at the end... Um, I found the uh, the the scene before Bowman becomes it's, it is Bowman who becomes the Star Child, isn't it? Yeah. Really sinister, and I don't know why. Is is he imprisoned? Is he there against his will? Do you think, or am I reading too much into it? No, you're not. No, it's um, that's the surface narrative. The, right. the surface narrative is that, uh, and Kubrick's when it, when he get asked by interviewers about this, he'd always describe it as basically as Clark would describe it. Yeah. Um, and basically the idea is that, you know, that Bowman had gone through the uh, the Stargate, and mm. uh, which was a portal that the aliens had created, and he'd gone through, and then the aliens create this room for him, mm. for him to feel comfortable in. Yeah. It doesn't look very comfortable. No. Does it? It's not, it doesn't look very no. welcoming. Um, create this room for him to be comfortable in uh, while they evolve him into the next since a star child they basically evolve him mm. and then he comes back to earth reborn as the star child and that's the big fantasy of the transhumanists right um so i think of transhumanism as a religion it's got a lot of hallmarks of religion mm. the big ultimate prize what the transhumanists are after is immortality mm. and they believe that if we can turn people into machines we'll live forever which is bullshit because mm. how many computers live forever? Mm. <laughs> they, they, they all like erode, don't they? Just like mm. people do. A lot of them don't, don't even last as long as people. <laughs> mm. Mm. That's true. That's true. Um, but uh, as, the way I view the the that, the ending of the film is that um, there's some some mention earlier in the film about dreams uh, when the astronauts are being interviewed. Uh, for some bullshit BBC documentary thing mm. about their mission to Jupiter. Mm. Um, and they're asked about hibernation. And one of them, Frank Purley, says, uh, it's exactly like being asleep, except you don't dream. Yeah. And um, the way I view it is Bowman defeats Hal, and that basically represents organic man mm. overcoming AI, overcoming technolo uh, technocracy, technological oppression and then the end of the movie i view that as being a dream sequence the right. entire ending okay and um, basically now that bowman is free of the technological constraints of hal he can now dream he can now sleep and actually dream right in the hibernation they weren't even allowed to dream before right and then he has a dream that is basically a representation of how he defeated hal and he's processing all that mm. and the, the thing for me that really sells that is in that room at the end, well, for one thing, he's on a bed yeah. when he's reborn as a star yeah. child. You dream in bed. Yeah. Um, when he arrives in that room, he's in the pod. Mm. He's got a suit. Mm. Uh, these are his technological dependencies. As the scene goes on, those technologies disappear, and he just becomes a guy in a, a robe, mm. a natural guy uh, who can breathe normally. And um, he's eating real food. They were eating mush earlier mm. in the film. Mm. Uh, fake synthetic food yeah and at the end he's eating dinner with proper food and an actual glass of wine and he's, he's recovered from technocracy he's right. become like that so that that for me that kind of sells it to me that the ending is basically a, a dreamlike representation of uh letting go of technological control 